Hi, I'm Holly Lyle, and this is the third of our series of live chats. And uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Let me go ahead and uh, wait just a second. Okay, yes, I've got folks already here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Hi. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is set up the poll for you that I put together today. Um, wow, it doesn't work. That's amazing. <sighs> Great. Attendees, polls, settings. Oh, okay, there we go. They changed the interface on me again. It's new software. And every time I start using it, they have changed something, and I don't realize that they've changed it until I try to use it. So, okay, uh, what we are looking for here is what? Great. Okay, we're not doing the poll today because the new software uh, did not include it in my list. So, what we are going to do today is talk a little bit about building a backlist. We are going to talk about um, indie publishing and copyright and um, getting your work edited and uh, a few other really critical things that you need to know. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on that. I've got my first question right here. And it is, uh, since I don't have any backlist to publish now, my plan is to write two novels and two novellas over the next several years without publish them, publishing them. Once I have those works completed, I'll publish them over a period of several weeks or months to build momentum. Then my goal would be to write a novel followed by a novella or several short stories or so forth every year uh, so that I can get some work out on a regular basis. Does this sound like a good strategy? Now, I know I have covered this before. I covered this in the last one, but this is where we're picking up today because we are going on to existing backlist and uh, some other indie publishing issues. So the answer to this is no, 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 that is an absolutely terrible plan. What you want to do is get your work out now because you can either work for nothing for years and years and years and finally put your work out or you can start earning a little bit now for work that may not be your best but you have the advantage as an indie publisher of always being able to go in and upgrade your your work make it better make it um, what do you want it to be and as you do this if you mark that this changes are substantive and uh, that you put this in Amazon, then Amazon will go ahead and let readers know that you have corrected the errors that readers have been complaining about and that you are presenting a new version for them and that from this new version, uh, they, if they download it, you know, they can, they can get what you've done in a better form. You will that way keep your existing readers and you will be able to grow a bigger audience and the objective here is simply to get readers. If you are a writer, you want to get readers. So, okay, the, the next thing then is, in today's market, realistically, how many novels would I need to publish to start, start seeing traction and being able to pay bills? Um, and again, this I think I covered in the previous one, but again, because it is specific to the topic today, we're gonna go over it again. Um, realistically, you don't want to start with novels. You want to start with short fiction. And you want to, because you can turn around short fiction quickly. You can create um, short stories in the 5,000 to 10,000 word range with good speed. And you can get it out there. You can get it up with an acceptable cover. Not a great cover, but just an acceptable cover. And you can start building your readership that way. And the way you do this is you set one bill, the smallest bill that you have every month, and that is your target. And you say, okay, when my fiction, right, when when what I'm making from Amazon and Barnes and Noble, every any place else, Smashwords, wherever you're putting your stuff, as soon as you pay off that bill with your writing, then you move to your next smallest bill and you set that up. And you say, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and pay off two bills a month. And you creep up on it. You creep up on full time just a little bit at a time because you can. 
you make your work better a little bit at a time because you can. You get better cover art as you are able to afford it, but you don't spend money on big ticket items like expensive quality cover art or expensive quality formatting until you are making enough from your existing work to pay for it. And if your objective is just to pay for your fiction, then you don't have to worry about the bill paying thing. But if your objective is to actually make a living at this, then you start with the bills and you do everything yourself. Or I've got a solution for you, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Um, but you can, you can get quality, good help, very inexpensively, if you know what you're doing. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, okay, so next question. And now we have, these are new questions. Uh, I have a backlist of eight books and several shorts. Would you recommend putting them out all at once or putting them out once a month? Or what sort of schedule should I be looking at to self-pub them? All I do, uh, I do all the formatting and uploading myself to pinch penny, so I want to maximize my earnings when I get them out there. If you have eight books sitting on your hard drive and they are ready to go, publish them all right now, today, right this minute, because you, you will, it, it it's going to take a little while to get people to find you. But when they find you, you want them to be able to find all of you. You want them to say, hey, that was pretty good. I want to see if this writer has done something else. And to have that book out there for them to pick up next. And then the one after that, eight, man, you, you, you are sitting on uh, the pretty good start of a career right there. Get them all out, put them up now. And again, improve them as you need to, improve them as you get feedback from Amazon that tells you that readers are letting you know that they found typos. Um, and when you deal with this, you go back to Amazon again and you say, um, yeah, there were some typos. My readers mentioned them. So this is the entire list right here of all the stuff I fixed. Please send them the email that lets them know that there is a better version now available. You can bump up your your cover art at the same time. You don't need to mention that. You don't need to mention that you have added some uh, some cover, some in material with new links to your site or anything like that. None of that is relevant. The only thing that is relevant to Amazon is that you have improved the quality of your offering. So that is what you show them. This is was this was my list of mistakes, and this is what I fixed. Please let my readers know so they can get the better version. Um, okay. <sighs> On to a short story. Okay. On a short story, as compared to a novel, how well can one get away with using friends, family as beta proofreaders? How literate are your friends and family? <laughs> um, uh, my husband does most of my content editing because he is a brilliant content editor. He's a really good writer. He is a brilliant content editor. He sees all the things that I make mistakes in. Um, or that I brush off when I'm writing it and think, well, you know, I really don't need to fix this. I can just kind of let this slide. And damn it, every time he will find the thing that I told myself would be OK and wasn't. And, um, and he'll point it out. And so then I go back through and I fix the things that he does. He is, however, like me, a really crappy copy editor. I'm a horrible copy editor. and. He is too. He, we, we don't see the specific mistakes as much as we need to. So, um, you know, if I had a friend who was a brilliant copy editor, uh, I would probably use my friend. But uh, I don't. So uh, in How to Think Sideways, there are reader benefits there, or there are member benefits there. And one of the member benefits is that there is a guy who does the copy editing for me who very generously uh, offered a deal to all of my uh, How to Think Sideways members that you can get a discount from him just for being a How to Think Sideways member because he knows you've taken my courses and what he's going to have to do for you is a lot less than what he's going to have to do for somebody who's just coming in out of nowhere and doesn't really know how this works. Uh, and again, I still I have something else that's really cool that we're working on now uh, that I'm going to get to shortly. but. You know, that's that's the primary question for that is if you have really quality friends and family who are heavy readers, who are capable writers, who understand what fiction is, then, yeah, go ahead and, and take advantage of that. And if you don't, then you're going to have to look elsewhere. OK, what services should a short story writer plan to start paying for when they have uh, the need? Fun uh, OK, when they have the needed funds, proofing, formatting, cover art. Um, 
this goes back to budgeting. If you want to do this for a living, then you have to get the money in first. And everything that you are not doing for yourself is slowing down your progress towards making it as a professional. That's tough. Um, it was it was tough when I was doing this because there was no self-publishing when I was doing this, or at least not anything reputable. So what I did was write stories and send them out for seven years and got back an entire large man's shoebox full of rejection slips. There were a hundred when I stopped counting and there were significantly more than that when I got my first acceptance. Uh, it, it's better than that now. If you are able to access indie publishing, then your life is better by far and the experience you will get with getting your fiction out there is better by far than what it used to be. You know, don't yearn for the old days when uh, everything was print publication and uh, professional publishers were looking for writers. and It wasn't that great. What's available now is better. Um, so you don't want to spend any more than you have to. And when you do have to start spending, you want to be able to spend as little as possible to get an acceptable job rather than hiring, uh, sneaking into Bantam or someplace like that and luring away the professional editor who works there and saying, you know, I will pay you whatever you want if you will edit my work for me. Um, you Saving money and watching your bottom line at all times is the only way to actually start making money at this. Now, if you go big, all bets are off. You know, if you go big, hire the, the, the famous editor from, from Bantam uh, and have her, you know, move her to the same town where you live so you can walk over and hand her your manuscript if you can afford it. But um, for most of us, including still me, the, the bottom line is the thing that you must always, 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 always watch because what you are living on is everything that you can spare from whatever you rack up in your bottom line. Um, Uh, let's see, how do I start self-publishing and how do I protect my stories while doing so uh, to make sure I get all the credit for writing them? Okay, well, first off, there is absolutely no way to protect your writing from everyone in the world because there are uh, many nations who are not signatories of the Berne Convention, which is the convention wherein it was decided that copyright, you know, would be protected among the nations who signed it. There were 160 plus nations that did sign it. Let me see if my pop-ins are working because I had all of these excellent, nope, crap. All right, I had all of these great links set aside for you and uh, they are not in my list because for whatever reason, I apparently I didn't uh, refresh the software or I came in here and set up this room too soon or something. So uh, what I wanted to to uh, present to you is not available to me. Um, so what, what you want to look up is Burn Convention, B-E-R-N-E -E Convention. And that will walk you through uh, the details of copyright law. Essentially, Anything you write, as soon as you write it, is, if you live in a burn convention nation, copyrighted to you immediately. Assuming, of course, that you didn't steal it from someone else. Uh, but if you didn't, you know, if you are a legitimate writer and, and not a plagiarist, then you own your work the second you write it. It's yours. Uh, it is the product of your mind and your imagination and your creativity and governments around the world respect that, that you did this, that it is, this is your thing, you created it, it belongs to you. And this is a very good thing. Um, you don't have to register for copyright. It doesn't hurt if you do. Uh, you don't have to um, purchase a copyright certificate. It doesn't hurt if you do. You do have to maintain records of the creation of whatever it is that you made. In case of uh, someone copying what you've done, I've had to do this once. I had somebody who took a bunch of my stuff and a bunch of stuff from another writer and put them up on Amazon as her work. And I had to go back through and prove 
prior publication of my work to Amazon, at, at which point they shut her down. You know, they took down not just the book that she was in, but several others in which she had apparently plagiarized other writers. And um, she went away. You have to be able to do that. You have to be willing to do it, too. Um, you have to value the product of your own mind and your own creativity enough that you are willing to stand up and say, this is mine, and here is the proof that this is mine, and fix this. Um, and sometimes it can get a little ugly. Uh, it didn't, fortunately. Amazon is very receptive to uh, proof of prior publication, and they took care of this for me very quickly. There are places where I have stuff that's still up uh, that belongs to me and that I cannot get taken down because there are websites run out of non-burn convention signatories. And uh, these countries basically say, yes, deal whatever you want. Um, so, like I said, if you write, if what you write is any good, it will be stolen. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, uh, you will, there are people who understand that what you create, if they want more of it, they are going to have to pay for it. And uh, to anyone who ever buys your book, you know, thank them in your mind, thank them in your heart for, for purchasing it. Uh, because the odds are, you know, so-so to, to very good that they could have stolen it. And uh, the fact that any of us has careers is because the majority of people are decent and honest and want to support the writers who create the work they love so those writers can keep on writing. Okay, on to the next question. Uh, what is the average age of people who start publishing and what should young 17 and under writers expect for feedback? This is, a, this is kind of a cute question. Um, when I was a senior in high school, the girl who came in the freshman class that year, who there was a buzz about her from the time she walked in the door, had published a book. She published a book in middle school, I think maybe, maybe in seventh grade, maybe in eighth grade, but she had sold and published a book. Um, and don't you think that that got her some real bennies with the English teachers? Um, I was envious. I was a senior, you know. I I knew I was going to be a professional artist or or a rock star. Either one. I was I was fine with either either one, but damn it, she had done something that I thought was really cool, and I hadn't done it. <laughs> so it turns out um, you can be any age. You can, if you are capable of putting together coherent sentences uh, and putting them into a story that people are willing to read, you can publish at any age. There is no boundary. You can publish when you're 103. You can publish when you're 12. Um, if you publish before you're 18, you need to make sure that your parents are covering for you on this, uh, that you have somebody who is watching out for your copyright, uh, that you have someone who is making sure that you don't have mail coming direct to you because people can be very scary. And if you're a kid, you don't need to deal with the individuals who will contact a kid author. Um, but, you know, as long as, as long as you are, if you are underage, if you have your parents' permission and their help, Go for it, because you can start making, you can start building a college fund, or you can start building your career right now. Uh, as far as what kind of feedback you get from people, well, most people are pretty decent. Some people are real jerks. Assume that uh, no matter what you put out, there's going to be somebody who gives you a nasty crit or a nasty review, just because that's how some people are. Uh, the majority of people who really like your work are not going to say anything, because that's how most people are. If they like it, well, you know, they don't feel the need to comment on it. If they don't like it, they do, uh, but, uh, you know, and this is tough if you're a kid because you haven't developed a thick skin yet. You don't understand that what other people think about you doesn't matter. Uh, as, you're, as an adult, even, this can be sometimes very difficult. But just assume that you will get some good comments, that you will get some bad comments, ignore the bad ones, follow the good ones, learn what you can from the process, and move on. Okay, um, beta readers. Now, this is uh, a massive question for anybody who is just desperate to, to get their work better as inexpensively as possible, and beta readers are a godsend. Um, what are the five questions? Now, if you have notebooks, you want to write these down, okay? And this will be on replay, so if you don't catch it this time, 
you can come back and uh, do the do the thing again and get your notebook. But um, what are the five best questions to ask a prospective beta reader to make sure they will be of value? This is an especially hard question because I've learned that sometimes the people you least expect turn out the best. What should a beta reading group be made up of? Okay. I don't think you need a group. I think that maybe you need one or two people who are willing to do this with you. Uh, I think it is valuable if they are writers because uh, writers understand a little bit more what actually needs to be fixed in a book. But it's if you have somebody who is a, a proficient and heavy reader, then that person can also be an extremely good beta reader. You don't want people who are just casual readers. Let me get a drink here real quick. Okay, you don't want people who are just casual readers reading for you. But when you find people that you think could be beta readers for you, here are the questions you ask them. Question number one, what genres do you like to read? It should go without saying, but doesn't. That if you have someone who hates reading romance, but that is a friend of yours, you do not ask this person to read your, to beta read your romance novel because you will not get valid feedback from it. You need to have somebody who actually reads within the genre. Okay, so question one, what genres do you like to read? Question number two, what is the difference between a crit and an edit? Now, this is where you don't, you're not going to ask this to somebody who's just a reader because a reader doesn't know. You're going to ask this to anybody who is offering to beta read for you who is a writer. And this is massive. This is a huge make or break deal question for any writer who wants to beta read for you um, and for whom you are beta reading to. A crit is asking questions that about the story where the reader sees possible problems and thinks that you might need to fix them. An edit is telling you what you need to fix. When you are beta reading, you do not want an editor. You want someone who can crit. And if you have someone who thinks that his job as a critter is to tell you how to fix your manuscript, you are in for a miserable bumpy ride. So that is the person that you say, well, yeah, thank you. Um, but I actually have a couple of other people and I'm going to have more feedback than I can handle and move on. Um, question number three. Three. Yes. Uh, what are, who are your three favorite authors? Okay, now this is, this is the same sort of issue, but on your end rather than their end. Um, if their three favorite authors are Stephen King and uh, J.K. Rowling and Lawrence Block, and you absolutely hate all three of those, reader, of those writers, then you don't want this person creating for you because what they are looking for is a specific sort of story that involves... Um, the kinds of, of themes and passions and uh, concepts that those writers bring to their work. And if you don't like those writers, then it is a sure bet that that is not what you're doing in your work. And you are going to get back a crit that is going to make you very unhappy. Um, and you are also going to have a crit reader who, or a beta reader who is not happy with you. Uh, so don't, don't do that. Um, just make sure that they actually like the kinds of work that, or the kinds of writers that you like, because if you both like the same writers, you have some common ground, and common ground is what will allow you to get a good crit. Okay, question number four. What is your opinion on X? Okay, X is whatever you have in your book that you think has a really good chance to piss somebody off. Okay, for me... Uh, I frequently have uh, characters of different genders in my work. Um, I am frequently, frequently politically incorrect. Uh, I enjoy uh, writing about religion and because I am uh, an atheist uh, and I enjoy creating religions and I enjoy developing the philosophies about them, uh, my writing about religion is invariably way off of what somebody who is a believer in religion is looking for in a book that contains religion. So for me, those, those are my sensitive areas. I have to say, well, you know, is this a big deal for you? 
um, are, are you going to get really upset that uh, I am uh, aggressively apolitical and, and detest politics on all sides of the board? Uh, are you going to get really upset that uh, I've got a gay character in this thing and he is portrayed positively because, you know, um, I think that's the way the world should work. Uh, so whatever it is that you have done in your book that you think is going to be a problem for some readers, ask your beta reader, is this going to be a problem for you? Because if it is, then that's not your reader. And um, you don't want to have to deal with philosophical areas of your book uh, and have them put on trial by somebody who detests a position that you have taken that it matters to you. Uh, you'll get that, that enough once the book goes out in public, but by then you have already stated your position. You have come down where where you live on this issue, and um, you just have to say, okay, well, I'm not the writer for you. Okay, final question number five: What do your what do you see as your role in creating my book? And you need to have the person that you are um, critting for answer the same question or ask you the same question because it comes down to are you looking for a soft read where you just want the person to find uh, some spelling mistakes and uh, you know maybe some hanging dangling prepositions and and possibly some places where you were a little bumpy on your transitions from scene to scene or do you want a reader who is going to say okay well um, I had a problem with your character uh, being portrayed as the hero and lying his ass off to get a free meal at a restaurant and everybody being okay with that. Uh, so you need, you need to know whether before, go, before you go in, you need to know what you want. And you have to be willing to say, okay, I'm just looking for a soft read here. Uh, all I want is you to find some typos, to find some some places where I was a little bumpy with my prose, um, and I, I I don't want you to to let me know that you have any problems with the content of the book at all. Versus, okay, look, uh, you know, I want to be able to make this the best thing that I can, and I am willing to get my feelings bumped around a little bit in exchange for you telling me what you really think. Um, so, and then when you find the person who shares the same view of a crit that you share, you'll be okay. All right, let's move on to editors and how you pick one. Now, we are still, this this entire day is devoted to indie publishing, so we are talking about editors that you are going to pay for, okay? Um, how do you pick an editor, meaning who is right for you? Is there a process? Questions. How do you know if an editor is right? Uh, this leads to should you self-edit? Um, so let's look first at how you find an editor. And this is hard. Uh, I mean, how, I, I don't know how people have been doing this. Uh, I know that I tripped over a pretty decent editor uh, who's been doing really good work for me. Um, but he came to me, I didn't go to him. So what I am doing and this is this is like my my pet project. This is my my secret freebie awesome thing that uh, I have have been working on and am working on. It's a site called ReadersMeetWriters.com, and it is spelled just exactly the way it sounds. And it is the ugliest, kludgiest, slowest, crappiest website on the internet. And I can say this with full honesty and passion and truth because I built the damn thing and it sucks. Uh, it is it is a horrible piece of software. It is it is WordPress and it's backed up with a slow back end and it's got all of this stuff in there that I am just but it is beta. Okay. Dan is building me a race car that this thing is gonna run on. And it's going to be awesome. Right now, however, if if you join and help me build this thing for free, and it, the membership is always going to be free, um, and a lot of the services are going to be free. The way that we are doing this, um, let me let me talk a little bit about um, 
one of the things that I'm doing, and I'm, this is in progress right now. I have beta testers right now who are testing the course that I am creating for indie certification on my site for um, creating manuscripts, content editing, copy editing, book layout design, print ebooks, um, book formatting for ebooks, writing cover copy, uh, cover design, and fiction launches. And I've got folks right now, a whole bunch of them, who are working through my out of print manuscripts for which the rights have reverted to me. And they are doing all of these processes using the instructions that I put down for them. And they are beta testing the process. And they are beta testing the courses that are going to be available in readersmeetwriters.com for people who want to either learn how to do this for themselves or who want to offer their services on readersmeetwriters.com or elsewhere um, to do this for other people. Uh, the courses, uh, you will have an option to get them for free. The way you will do that is by participating in the things that are going on on the readersmeetwriters.com site. You get points for everything you do, and you can then use those points to purchase things like uh, certification courses that you have to take and pass. Um, and I sign off individually on each person who goes through. So it's not like a, an automated process. You actually have to, to show that you have done this, and I will look at what you've done and you know, give you the certification if it passes, tell you why it didn't if it doesn't. Um, and if you take the course once and you don't pass it, you can take it again for free uh, a second time so that it's not like uh, you used up a bunch of points or you used up real money and then you don't get anything out of it. If you don't go through it and get it right the second time, that's different. Uh, then you have to go back and, and pay again. But uh, So we are building this thing right now. And our objective is to, within readersmeetwriters.com, be able to offer the people who can do these things, who can crit, so that you can find beta readers. And who you can find beta readers who know how to crit, so that you can find content editors who know how to content edit, because they are going to have done it on my books or other books by other writers. Uh, and we'll get into that in a minute, because that also is kind of cool. Um, who know how to run a fiction launch. And that's not available yet for anybody because I and my fiction launch people are still testing this process. We have had our first launch. It was very successful, uh, excitingly so. Our guy got uh, doubled his, his email list. He sold almost all of his print copies of the book within the first week. Uh, he sold uh, a bunch of copies of the, the ebook version. Uh, so, you know, I have hard numbers for the guys who are doing this with me. Um, I'm just going to kind of let you know it went really well, but it is still a work in process. We are still testing fiction launches, uh, and it's, it's a complicated process, but uh, the first test didn't blow up, which was what we were all kind of anticipating. It actually worked, so I think we're on to something, and we will be building on that. Anyway, getting back to what I was, was saying before, um, selected beta testers are going to be going in, uh, the people who actually want to do this and get paid for it, uh, and from them, as many as I can actually fit into this first beta test, uh, are going to be going into the advanced program where they're going to take an accelerated version of how to revise your novel as a course on editing, content editing. And then um, they will be helping me run a couple of launches. They will be working with me to run a couple of launches uh, for volunteers. And the people who volunteer will be folks who have books in readersmeetwriters.com. This is all going to be done in-house. So if you are a member of readersmeetwriters.com, um, then you can apply for things like beta testing, uh, the stuff that the, these folks are doing right now. You know, they were volunteers. They were people who volunteered to beta test for me in this particular program. You can volunteer to have a book that you have done serve as a certification test book, which means that it will be done without you having to pay money. It will not be done without you having to pay. In order to fit on the list, you will need to have done other things in 
uh, readersmeetwriters.com that uh, will allow you to have um, some points added up. And I don't know how many points it's going to be. I anticipate that getting your book edited, formatted, cover edited, and launched for free is going to be a pretty popular thing. Uh, so it's probably going to be a fair number of points to get it done. Uh, if you join now, you can start earning points. Um, if you join later, there are going to be point people with points um, who are ahead of you in line. And I got to tell you right now, my beta testers, for what they are doing, they are going to be getting some serious points for this. Um, all right, so if you if you want to volunteer, again, this is if you if you want to join us, you just sign it. it the, the site is terribly slow, and I apologize for this. One of the things that I'm doing later today is go in and work on the back end a little bit, see if I can speed it up. But um, <clears throat> it's it's not a good theme. It's running on WordPress, and people know what fun I have had with WordPress lately. Uh, it just completely broke the admin end of my, my How to Think Sideways site for a whole week, and Dan finally got that fixed for me. It was, there was no, no help from WordPress on it whatsoever. Uh, so yeah, we're getting off WordPress as quickly as possible, and in the meantime, this site is on WordPress, and I apologize, it's what I have. Okay, so anyway, my, my, that is the long answer to where can you find good editors. Um, we're working on that. And you are going to be able to get editors that you can afford. Uh, then we'll, we'll have some guys who are in the premium program who have got through all their certifications and stuff who are starting to take paying customers. Uh, and uh, OK, let's move on. Price, uh, OK, copyright, ISBNs. OK, that was the other thing. Are there budget editors out there? Um, is there a way to barter to get them to read a whole manuscript? Again, that's what I'm working on. Uh, at the moment, a complete edit is out of my price range, mine too, because I require that a book pay for itself within the first two months, and uh, I can't afford expensive editors uh, for, for full-length novels. So my full-length novels until now just have been sitting on my hard drive because I couldn't, I don't have the time or anything else to deal with them. Now I've got beta testers who are getting them out there for me. And you, I, I, am, I am very f uh, positive about this process. I have had really good luck before with using uh, crowdsourcing and things like that to improve the quality of my work. And that's essentially what this is. Um, so that that's one of the things I'm very excited about being able to offer. Anyway, OK, we're going to move on now to ISBNs. Would you suggest use of ISBNs in indie publishing? I'm from the Caribbean, would have to give one copy of my books to the local library as a condition of obtaining the IBNs. Uh, ISBNs, the thing is I'm creating ebooks and don't have physical copies, so I'm tempted to skip the ISBN step. ISBNs are useful if you need to have your book in books in print. Uh, they are useful for uh, categorizing stages of upgrade. For example, if you write uh, the first edition of a book and then you write the second edition of a book and the third edition of a book, each of those will have a different ISBN and will therefore be, there will be a clear progression uh, in what you have done for readers who are looking for the most current version of the book. If you are writing fiction and if you are primarily working in um, Kindle and EPUB and uh, other PDF formats, all, all of the myriad formats that are available now, then ISBNs are not useful. They don't get you into the bookstore. They cost a lot of money. Um, they can only be used once. So if you keep updating the book and correcting it and fixing it and changing uh, the content within, cover art is never a problem. You can change cover art every day of the week if you want, and that will not require a new ISBN, but if you change the content of the book, it does. Um, just corrections, you can still use the same ISBN. If there is a content issue, as a writer points out to you that you forgot about Bob in chapter three and just left him out of the rest of the book, and he had an important role in chapter three, so you have to go through and add Bob, then you'd have to get a new ISBN. 
I don't I don't use them for uh, my uh, Kindle and Nook and EPUB versions. Uh, I don't uh, Kindle and Nook and PDF versions. I don't. Uh, I did initially, but uh, I, I'm doing a lot of updates. And one of the huge benefits of doing indie publishing is that you can go in and you can update your work and fix it and make it better. You don't have to have the crappy first edition that went out there, sit there forever. Um, and you don't have to, and this is really big, you don't have to lose all of the uh, reviews that you got for the first edition of the book when you add a new SBN and you can't use that page on Kindle, Amazon, uh, or on, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, any other place that you had the book before, because a new ISBN also requires that this book be treated as a new book, and all of the link juice that you had, all of the, all of the exciting reader comments that that said, "Oh my God, I can't believe I found this writer. He's brand new and he's awesome," are gone. So. If you are indie publishing, use this cool thing that you have obtained, that, that this gift that you have to fix the stuff that you are doing and leave it in the same place and don't worry about ISBNs. Now, for your print copy, yeah, you must have an ISBN and that's for any bookstore. That's for Amazon, that's for Barnes & Noble, that's for any place. You can use theirs. Um, I bought a thousand ISBNs because I had um, a refund from the IRS one year and I thought, okay, well, um, I'll get them now. And my objective now is to use them all in books, hardcovers, <laughs> print versions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have, I think about 950 of them left. So anyway, yeah, um, for print copies, yeah, you need them for, for uh, EPUB versions. You don't, and they can be actively detrimental when, when you are trying to build a career. Copyright. Um, in regards to copyright, I know if you trad publish, the, the publisher will register under your name. But what about indie publishing? Do you need to register your work to protect it before indie publishing it? No, you don't. You can. You don't need to. Uh, it, are there any rules for using, oh, okay, <laughs> this is the other people's copyrights now. So this is a completely different kettle of fish. Okay, it, are there any rules for using a well-known character in the story? For example, can the character who favors a superhero toy, for example, Batman or Superman, be turned physically into that toy, but he won't have any powers and won't be recognized as, as such a superhero? Or is it better to create your own popular toy? DC will sue your ass off. Do not, do not use anybody else's work uh, in your stuff without getting a written, uh, legal, on legal paper, written proof that you have the okay of the original creator of this thing and the rights owner of this thing. Do not, because you will lose your shirt and everything that's beneath it. Um, yeah, me, your content, when you are especially, when you are publishing commercially, the publisher will go through and say, eh, you can't do that, and, and then you fix it. If you are indie publishing and you think it might be okay, assume that it's not. If you didn't create it and you don't own it, um, don't, 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 don't use it. <laughs> they use it. Lawyers will eat you for lunch. <laughs> okay, on pricing your books. Um, how do you say, decide on prices for short stories? By word count, theme, something else? Uh, how do you... I decide on word count. Um, right now, I am experimenting back again with uh, $1.99 for my... 10 story flash fiction episode. Um, and I am also, I, I am experimenting with uh, 
a dollar ninety nine for my no I'm sorry I'm experimenting with a dollar ninety nine for the first episode of the Longview series because uh, I would like to get people into that it is a shorter story uh, so I want to make sure that that people feel like they're getting their money's worth and that was a shorter story and I want to make it more accessible the rest of them are about 30,000 words so I'm publishing those at uh, 299 I'm thinking thinking yeah you know 10,000 words for a dollar is not bad so 30,000 word stories yeah about three bucks um, a novel I'm at the moment torn between $4.99, which is what I was at, and $5.99, which is what I'm at right now. These are roughly 100,000 word novels. And um, they're not selling as well as we had hoped, <laughs> says the publisher in me. So, but then I haven't, I haven't done anything new lately. So I'm sitting on those. I'm leaving them at $4.99, $5.99 5 right now. I'm not sure. Damn, I'm really not sure where I have those. I am leaving them until I start getting some new material out. And then I will see if uh, they're selling well enough to satisfy me or if uh, a bump downward by about a buck on my, downlist, on my back list and keeping my front list at the higher price will work sufficiently. It is a work in progress. Pricing is not a static thing. Fortunately, the places where you are selling your work don't make it a static thing. You can go into your account and you can change the price at any time. Um, so, just there are there are books on this, and I've read several of them, and some of them say price high, and some of them say price low, and uh, there is no consensus. So, price, see how it works for you try increasing the price see how that works for you because I, I have to say if you have a full-length novel and you are selling it for 99 cents then you are indicating that it is of low quality for the majority of people who read they're gonna say a full-length novel for 99 cents what's up with that it must not be very good if you are if it's not very good then you you know fix it up get it back out there after you have it edited and in the meantime you know if you want to sell it for 99 cents maybe you'll sell a few copies maybe you'll get some readers maybe you'll get some feedback maybe you'll figure out what it needs and then you can fix it up and you can present it with all of the fixes to Amazon who will then let all of the previous readers know that you have the new version of the book available and all they have to do to get it is download it and that uh, you know it it contains fixes now they are much more interested in typos than they are in content editing. Um, so again, give them the list of the typos and the spellos and the, the formatting errors that you have fixed and don't worry about the content editing. Um, they, they don't care about that. It doesn't matter to them. It matters to your readers and it matters to you. It does not matter to Amazon. They just want bug-free books. They don't care if they're any good. Uh, well, no, okay. Let me take that back. I'm sure they do care because they make a profit for every book that sells. And you want better books out there because better books sell better. Okay. And finally, no, not finally. We've got a couple more of these. Uh, how does one know how to price a self pub book? Okay, that's the same thing. Indie publi publishing is wonderful in so many ways, but at the same time, I feel like readers are much more reluctant to spend money on a new self-pubbed author's work than a new traditionally pubbed author. Um, the logic being anyone can self-pub their work, uh, even if it's bad, at least the publisher, with the publisher, there's some credibility. Obviously, you haven't been reading the same commercially published work I have. Um, there, are, there are books out there that are just, I, I, I honestly, think I, I don't know how they got published commercially because they are just god awful um, the best way to cover to combat this is to learn how to launch your fiction and again this is this is a work in progress we're not there yet you know I've got my next beta launch test tester Kat Gerlach uh, she it, has a bunch of stories and we are going to launch them the last launch we did for Tom Vetter 
after that, I've got some other people in my group. And if I run out of people in my group before we know we have a working process, then I will take some volunteers from outside the group and we will do some launches for them. We are going to have a process that works and you are going to be able to learn how to do this. Uh, this, I will tell you, is going to be a paying course. This is not going to be a freebie um, because this is, this is taking a ton of my time <laughs> and a lot of effort and a lot of thinking and an enormous amount. I have to do an, an enormous amount of physical work uh, to set up these launches. And it takes me days to just do the basic setup and days to do the tracking and, and a ton of other things. So uh, I am investing in this in order to create a relatively inexpensive launch course that just covers fiction, it just, well, and memoirs, uh, the two kinds of books that are almost impossible to sell with a traditional product launch. Uh, and I know because I've tried and uh, I know how to do a really good product launch and I have done a bunch of them and they have gone like gangbusters and this process does not work for fiction. So I am finding out what is and I've got a couple of other uh, beta tester researcher folks who are in there with me and we are slogging it out and one of these days I'm going to be able to tell you, okay, well the best way to combat having nobody know you is to do a book, fiction book launch and I can show you how. Okay, so with that, that is the end of the regular question. So now I'm going to skim over here to the chat questions and see if I can find. Okay. Okay, there should be the first question up now. Have you ever used Book Gorilla or BookBub? Not only have I never used them, I have never even heard of them. So if you have some cool information on these, I would really, truly appreciate if you could let me know uh, what you find out. If you have any recommendations, uh, just go to my customer service desk, the help desk. It's linked from every single page on uh, my personal site, hollylow.com. It's linked from every single page on howtothinksideways.com. Or if you're good with uh, URLs, it is uh, novelwritingschool.com forward slash support. Uh, and just let me know. Let me know about what you find out about these because no, I didn't even know they existed. Okay, uh, next question. What is a good price for a 400 page novel? Uh, okay, I'm going to assume pages, when you're talking pages, you're talking manuscript pages, uh, 200 words a page, 8,000, 80,000 words. Um, my stuff that I sell at that link, I, I sell at $4.99 a book. Uh, that's that that is a full-length traditional novel uh, when Talon comes out Talon is 230,000 words and Talon uh, Yeah, right at right at 230,000 words and Talon is going to be uh, maybe a dollar or two more because that is a big big book um, And I'm gonna pay a little extra in download fees from Amazon and things like that but um, What I'm charging uh, Four ninety nine, maybe maybe five nine five ninety nine for new release. Bump it down to four ninety nine once it's been out for a while. Okay, okay, and another is Balker a good way to have proof of publication? No, uh, ISBNs have absolutely nothing to do with copyright. They they are not proof of copyright. They are not useful for for, for copyright. Uh, you can buy a uh, hundred. ISBNs right now, go in, fill out all the detailed information on them, and have written absolutely nothing about the books that uh, you have created ISBNs for. Uh, so no, they are they are not. Having, having the book in a print copy uh, with the date of publication on it in your possession is a very good proof of when you came out with the book. Uh, and you can do that, I mean, uh, with uh, print on demand and delivery from places like Amazon, you can have a print copy of your book. And it has your date of publication, and uh, you can hand that to anybody, send a copy of it to anybody, and say, this is, this is my book, and here is all the information, and uh, this is when it came out, and I can prove it came out, because that's when I put it up on Amazon, and that's when I put it up on these other sites. And I have the dates on the sites, 
that show that this is the date that the book was entered. And uh, I have the dates on my hard drive where this is the date that I submitted it. And I have the emails and this is the date that it was published. And that's proof that you did the work and that you have the work and that you have the dated work and that you don't ever throw anything away. Um, all right, next question. What is a good rate of sales per week that an author can expect to sell his or her, her short stories? Okay, well, there's a good rate of sales and then there's what you can expect. Um, <laughs> a good rate of sales is what's gonna pay your bills and uh, your bills vary and your, your sales will vary, but a good rate of sales is what does that. The, the number of sales you can expect per week is there is there is just no way of even beginning to guess um you you'll have a book that you think you've got a great cover on it you've got great cover copy uh you've promoted it to what you think are all the right places you let your list know about it and you've set it out there and crickets sing in the silence uh you you put out something that you don't think anybody's even going to notice and you sell 100 copies oh, the first week and 200 copies the second week and more than that the third week um, and you become somebody uh, who who has a bestseller without having any idea how you did it it's it's a weird process it is truly a weird process finding readers and finding people who will show up and getting them onto a mailing list so that you can talk to them and let them know when you've got stuff out there um, will you know, will help, but there is no there's nothing that you can expect. Not yet. <laughs> We're not there yet. We're we don't have the thing that is going to get you a um, hundred sales per week per book. Which, you know, which that would be pretty nice. 100 sales per week per book would be pretty nice. You get 10 books out there and you're talking some nice money. If you're not selling it for 99 cents and getting 30% cut. Um, so make sure that you're pricing so that you can make a living on, on what you do. But make sure that you're pricing so that people will be willing to buy your books so that you can make a living. Experiment. Okay. All right, uh, what counts as proof of prior publication and how do I keep records? You just save everything you do. You save your first draft, you save your second draft, you save your third draft, you save your handwriting crap. Um, if you don't have the space in your house, which I don't, uh, we have, we live in a shoebox, it's a little condo, and uh, we have no storage space, none. So what I do is I run my manuscript in print format with my my type edit with my handwritten notes and everything through my scanner uh, I've got a halfway decent printer that's got a little auto feed scanner and I just scan the sucker in and I've got the date on there which the scanner will do and I save it as a PDF and then it's on my hard drive as a PDF with all my handwritten notes with all my all of my edits with everything and you know you have a problem with me well I've got proof <laughs> okay. So uh, I have someone. Okay, he says, I have a book out since three five fifteen, which is an adventure about the hunt for the yeti in the Himalaya. I have a second novel that is ready for editing, which is an erotic comedy. Is it really necessary to have a pen name to write in different genres? Okay, are you going to have nine year olds reading your adventure book? Are you going to have fifteen year olds reading your adventure book? Because if you have if you have a broad enough readership that you are going to have underage people reading your work and you don't want to just get into all sorts of trouble with with your content, then yeah, you need to have a pen name. Uh, because if you're writing erotica, you're you are specifically gearing that up for an 18 and older audience, or depending on the country where it's available, um, just the age, age of legal majority. And that is going to require 
uh, certain safeguards. Uh, sometimes the books have to be categorized differently, and they have to be put out of out of sight for people um, who are, you know, 12 to 15, 17, uh, not not legal. So yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> just I have there is this is the only thing where I say yes. You just absolutely must have a pen name if you are writing both erotica uh, or porn and something for a general audience. Uh, I, there's there's just no way that around that that's not going to uh, end up in you ending up in some trouble. Okay, I am looking for some more questions. And it looks like, amazingly enough, I actually got them all this time. No, okay. Uh, all right. What is the best genre to write in statistically? Uh, I've heard that the romance uh, romance sells 87% 80 of the books in America. Well, if you like romance, then that's a self-answering question. The best genre to write in statistically is the one that you can write without going home at night and eating your gun, okay? Um, I happen to like writing stuff with romance in it. Uh, I, I can't write just straight romance. I can't. I can't do that. I have to have crime uh, or paranormal elements or something else in there, suspense. Um, but I, I am incapable of writing just plain romance. When I say straight straight romance, I don't mean um, male female. I just mean that's the only thing in a book. I if I had to write now, yeah, I don't mind reading them but they don't hold my attention when I'm writing. So statistics can make you miserable. You know, you have to write what you love. And I say this all the time. And sometimes people listen to me. And sometimes they say, well, yeah, but I'm going to be the writer whore who just does it for the money. And it'll be OK. And just doing it for the money never works out for anybody. Not, not if you want to be happy, not if you want to love your work, not if you want to say, this is what I do, and this is a part of who I am. And um, this, is, uh, this is what matters to me as a human being and what I want to share with the world. So, you know, statistically, yeah, write romance. Statistic, no, is statistically probably write erotica because I know that that uh, people who are doing that are are selling indie selling like nothing I have ever seen. Um, what do you want to contribute to the world? What do you want to be your legacy when you're dead? That that somebody picks up and says this this is who this person was. Who do you want that person to be? Okay, the next thing here is, um, how do you keep a pen name from being revealed via public record search? I have no clue. Um, I have absolutely no, no clue how that's done. I know that people do it. I know they do it successfully. Uh, this is probably one of those instances where I would spend the bucks to ask a legal guy, a genuine uh, lawyer, this question. And I, I know that there are law sites where you can can ask them a question for like 40 or 50 bucks and uh, they'll, they'll answer. And at that point, at the point where you are wanting to keep something secret that if, if you are also writing general, general fiction, you really need to know how to keep secret, um, Ask, ask a guy who knows. <laughs> ask, ask a lawyer, man, because that's, I got absolutely nothing on that. Okay. How do you grow your newsletter list? Okay, that's a pretty cool question. And it is definitely relevant for indie publishers because if you don't have a list, you don't have a business. Um, a newsletter can be anything from you letting folks know when you have a new book coming out to you doing little uh, 
snippets of something that you wrote that day that you want to share to your readers and you just send it to them in an email to uh, you giving away discounts for early bird uh, buyers of your book let's say that uh, you have Amazon isn't going to bring it out for three days so you want to have a little three-day sale on your own site uh, and you are going to give the folks who come in and buy your your fiction uh, during those first three days uh, a discount you can you can do that or you can have if you are into KDP uh, direct and you are willing to just have your book on Amazon you can go in and uh, have them offer the book for free or for a discount or something uh, for a couple of days and then you can let your your newsletter readers know about that uh, you grow your list by making it worthwhile for your readers to read it and for them to recommend your list to somebody else and every piece of content that you puts out you put out that you send out to email that you want to have people read has to meet one of those two tests is this going to be useful for uh, the person that I'm sending it to is this going to be something that he or she finds cool is it something that is going to be worth that person's time um, and second is it going to be good enough that this person is going to say hey this is awesome I will send I will forward this email to a friend of mine because that is how people start finding your list uh, also you have to have a really great landing page and um, I've been doing some experimenting with those uh, I'll have some of them up on uh, hollylyle.com once we get over to the new site I am I am just so frustrated with WordPress in the current site and Dan's building me something cool so I'm not doing any site work on on the existing sites other than just maintenance and doing new posts and things until we get to the new software because um, I'm helping to develop the software and designing all of the different cool stuff that's going in it which is so fun um, <laughs> and um, and I want to be able to to let people see what this stuff is once we get it out there because the software that we are developing for my use uh, a no number of people have expressed some interest in and uh, Dan has decided that he wants to make it available and I want to make the writing plugin that I'm developing available uh, for people who want it so okay anyway uh, next question here I have 12 five-star reviews out of 14 total reviews for my new book I'm thinking there's not enough support from Amazon because I published also through Smashwords who distribute to iBooks, Barnes & Noble, etc. Have you experimented with KDP Select which makes it exclusive to Amazon? Yes, I have. Yes, I, I have experimented. Um, you don't get really any... The, the only things you get by being in KDP Select are that you can put your book on sale for one week in a three month period I think or you can give it away for that same one week in a three month period please don't quote me on this um, I'm not looking at the Amazon terms of service right now so I'm not sure but I wasn't interested in giving my book away and um, because I it, it just it didn't do anything for me and I get much better response by having my book on other sites this is going to be a your mileage may vary answer this is my experience with it I can't even begin to guess what it's going to do for you give it a try um, watch the dates very carefully because if you do see that you are not getting the kind of sales from it that you want and you try their freebie thing or you try their uh, on sale thing and it doesn't add anything for you then you need to have you, you are going to have to manually go in to KDP select and remove the book from it during this tiny little window that you have between when the book becomes available for renewal and the time that it is automatically renewed and once it is automatically renewed you're looking at another three months of whatever sales you get from Amazon before you can put it on other places and they are dead serious about this and they are the 800 pound gorilla in the arena you need Amazon you need to not piss Amazon off so 
pay attention to your dates and get them right. Uh, if you want to do this and then you find out you don't like it, be very careful. Make sure you know the date. Go in, take it off when it's, when it's done, and you can do so without making a big hassle about it. All right. Okay, let's see. We've got a couple, another question here, which is, have you used the giveaway on CreateSpace? No. No, I haven't. Um, I don't make that much on my CreateSpace books. I don't sell very many of them. It might be useful for me to to test this and see if it increases print copies, but um, I, I'm not I'm not all that excited about what print copies do. I love the smell of books, and there are still some things that I will buy in in print. But the fact that I make almost all of my money from uh, e-published versions of things, I think, is awesome. Uh, I don't. I don't think that anyone is missing out on anything by not buying my, the version of my book in print. I offer it uh, for the things that I do offer it for, because I want people who like books to be able to have them in the format that they want, and um, that's it. That's it. Uh, I've. I have. Wow hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I think, I think I'm pretty close to a thousand books um, on my Kindle now. And, you know, we had, once upon a time, uh, eight full height, full width bookshelves that we had stacked um, two deep and like five or six stacks high with the book stacked sideways. And I think, I think when we figured it out, we had something like eight to 10,000 books. Um, and then we had to move, and we had to get rid of all of them. And because we couldn't afford the truck that was the size that would allow us to take them with us. And I've never gone back. I mean, we still have some books. There were some books that we could not get rid of. I mean, there are just some books that are a part of your life, and, and they you had them in physical form. That was how you read them first. They are a part of who you are, and they come with you. And we still have those. But everything else? No. <laughs> All right. Um, Tamsin, what are the basic elements that make up uh, a great landing page? Let's say you are self-publishing your first work, so no backlog to mention. Just to get them to sign up to your list. The only thing a landing page is good for is to get people to sign up your, for your list. If you're talking about a sales page, that's a completely different thing. And that includes copywriting uh, and some significant experience with copywriting and headline testing and split testing and a whole bunch of other things. If you are talking about just the basic elements that make up a great landing page, which is a page where you're going to send uh, a potential reader to sign up for your mailing list, you need um, an attractive image. You need less than 100 words of really good copy explaining what your list is about. You need to show the reader why the reader wants to be on your list. Uh, it has to be, you have to be giving away something that you can prove the value of right away. And uh, to do this, you are either going to be, my, my most successful list is my writing tips list. And I currently have something like, I'm almost to 100 tips. Um, and at, at that point, uh, I am probably going to move the folks in that list to a new list so that I can publish all the tips in that list as a book, uh, or as several books, because actually I think I came up with some just insane amount of words that is, that is in that list. But I am giving away weekly uh, a free writing tip, and they are really good tips. And uh, people who are on that list have been on that list for years, and I am still adding to it as I can. I, my objective is to make it absolutely awesome. Every single email that I send out, my objective is to, to give my reader something spectacular that he has never read before. And if, and so that's what I want to convey on the landing page, is when you get this, you are going to get something spectacular that is going to help you with your writing. 
if you are doing it for fiction, then you want to give a demo of what you write. Um, you want a free book for people who sign up. Now, it can be a free 10-episode uh, flash fiction book, like I offer, you know, I show you how to write in, um, how to write flash fiction that doesn't suck. Uh, it can be, it can be something, but it has to be something that you know is good. And this is where you want to break out your beta testers and you want to make sure that they have gone over this thing and they agree that it is good. And you're not looking for yes men here. You're not looking for the soft beta. You're looking for the hard beta, the one where people are going to tell you what they really think. And then you want to listen to what they really think and you want to make this awesome. Because when you have somebody sign up for your list, they are, they are trusting you with a lot. I mean, they're trusting you with their email address. They're trusting you not to abuse that email address. And you are trust, they are trusting you to be worth their time. Because time is the only thing we can't replace. Um, so it is the most valuable commodity in the universe. A person who signs up for your mailing list is trusting you with his time. And that's a hell of a big thing. So make it worth his time. Uh, and make sure on your, your cover, or, or on, your, on your landing page, that you show him, you show him how this is going to be worth his time. Not just that you are going to give away something for free that he's going to get and download, but that when he gets it and downloads it, it is awesome. All right. Here we got, uh, can you talk a little bit about cover art? I'm a pretty good graphic artist and want to create the cover myself. Um, I, I am learning this myself. And what I can say about cover art is <laughs> it's a bitch to get right. Um, don't fool around with fonts. Uh, I mean, don't, I, I have learned, don't stretch them and twist them and make them all into funny shapes because it really, really ticks off people who knows font, who know fonts. Um, pick clear, compelling cover art. Make it the size that Amazon says, which is a little taller and narrower than I always anticipate. Make sure that when you squeeze it down to the size of your thumb, and I mean this literally, when you have it on your screen, on your desktop, you put your thumb right up against it, and you... If it does not cover, if your thumb does not cover the cover art, you haven't got it small enough yet. Scoot it down so that your thumb can cover it completely. And when your thumb can cover it completely and you remove your hand, make sure that you can still read the title and your name. Because if you can't, it is not going to be readable on all of the tiny little spaces that cover art gets shoved on websites. And if they can't read it, and they can't see the title, and they can't see the author, you're not going to sell the book. All right. And are there any more questions? This was it actually worked. In spite of not having all of the stuff that I had set up for you as, as links, uh, this actually worked a little better today. Uh, the, the questions were much easier to follow. So whatever they've done that they fixed in the last update helped a lot. Uh, so that's I'm using... Uh, Webinar Jam, and if you were, you know, if you were considering getting it, uh, the fact that I didn't have it set up correctly to get my questions and my polls showed up to show up today was my fault, apparently, for not getting them in in time that they were added to this this uh, chat. But aside from that, okay, um, that's it. I'm going to give you one more pitch. If you are a reader, if you are a writer, and if you would like to help us create something truly awesome, please go to readersmeetwriters.com and join for free as a founding member. Uh, you will always be able to join for free, but if you are a founding member, you, member, you will get points for being a founding member, just for showing up and asking questions and answering questions and uh, participating in the surveys and all the other stuff that we've got in there. And aside from that, uh, can you send the links in an email? Sure. Sure, I can do that. Uh, I will send out the links for all of the different st stuff I've discussed here uh, in an email to the folks who are signed up for this webinar. So look for uh, an email from this webinar 
going out in about probably half an hour because I'll have to go find those links again. <laughs> and um, and that's it. So thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I had a lot of fun, and I hope that you found this useful. Um, I will set up the page for the next one sooner so that if you have some questions and you're not going to be able to be here, you can ask the questions there. And uh, that was Michelle's question. And aside from that, thanks very much. Um, and I had a really great time, and I hope you did too.